Hi, it's Tatum. And just before we begin, I just wanted to say it's incredible that we get such fantastic feedback about how useful this podcast is. But we really need your help to make sure more people get to hear it. So please do share us with your friends, write a review. It really bumps up our visibility. Like, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And just want to say thank you so much for doing that. Right, on with the show. Wait a second. This isn't your grandma's cancer show. Not your grandma's cancer show. Hi, I'm Tatum Duroc, and today we're finding out what is happening in the science of cancer. Do we have reasons to be hopeful? And I have the perfect person here to enlighten us. Professor Gerard Evan is a professor of cancer biology at King's College London and is also a principal group leader at the Francis Crick Institute, which I discovered is quite hard to say <laughs> really fast. <It> is. <laughs> um, and he's back to answer the big questions. So welcome back, Gerard. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a delight to see you again. You too. Tell me what keeps you so passionate and so excited about the work that you do. Well, I, it's changed recently in the last 10 years. I, I think I've been in cancer research, uh, cancer research for 40, nearly 40 years since I was a graduate student and even when I, before then as an undergraduate. And most of that time was pretty frustrating. We were just kind of compiling uh, toxic drugs in various ways and trying to treat patients, not really knowing what we were doing. I mean, actually, a huge number of patients were cured during that time, but not in a very sophisticated way. And since then, in the last 10 years, everything's changed because we've begun to understand the actual molecular processes which drive and cause and maintain cancers. And we've been able to develop drugs now that interfere with those processes. And then in the last few years, the last uh, three or four years, also we've worked out at the start of how to get the body's own immune system to, to basically um, attack cancers. So we're using you know the ultimate nanotechnology, which is your cells in your body and, and lining them up so that they can actually identify cancers and then kill those cancer cells without harming the, the other cells in the body. So this is just the most exciting time to be a cancer researcher and I'm, I feel very blessed that I'm part of it. I can see your eyes lighting up as you're saying that and I can imagine when you were referring back to the time before, um, it was almost uh, like using a blunt instrument. Very much so. Very um, much so. And it was working, but it was with a, a lot of impact. Would you say these newer ideas and, and, and technologies and understanding and immunotherapy drugs mm -hmm. are um, sophisticated in that they are also causing less of a drastic impact on the patient. Very much so. I mean, essentially, most of the, these targeted therapies are not intrinsically poisonous. Whereas before, most of the treatments for cancer were basically things that killed cells. And, you, and you know, they just killed cancer cells rather more than they killed normal cells. So not always and that was the problem with the side effects. But now we're, we're, we, we're making chemicals and, are, and using drug approaches which are not inherently toxic except to the cancer cells. So the cancer cells have a requirement for the activity of these targets, which normal cells don't, or which normal cells don't all of the time. And so we can actually go in there and specifically kill the cancer cells, or at very least stop them and turn them into normal tissues, at least uh, per probably permanently. And we can at least do that um, without the, the horrible collateral damage that we used to do. Uh, well, I'm loving the sound of this. Um, if we're to sort of take it back to um, kind of if someone's listening to this and, you know, they're thinking about maybe their cancer. Mm -hmm. And can you start us with, like, what is cancer? Yes, well, actually, it's uh, there are two questions. What, what is cancer and why does cancer kill people? And they're, they're related and they're not simple questions. 
So one, we have to understand that we're made of billions of cells. We're made of uh, 100,000 billion cells. I mean, they come in different shapes and sizes and build all the tissues and the organs of the body. And uh, they all arise uh, ultimately from a single cell, which is the, the, the zygote, which is what mum and dad make, and the egg that hatches uh, out of that and various other sort of things. So there's a lot of proliferation and expansion of these cells. They all contain the same genetic material, but the, the genes which are activated in those different lineages of cells in the body and different organs are, are activated in a different way, different combinations and various other sort of things. And we're, we're really just beginning to understand that, that as a process. So um, the, the expansion of cells and also once uh, the expansion of cells into an adult or a, a child or an adult human being involves massive replication of the genetic material and every time genetic material is replicated there's a danger that there are going to be mistakes. Now those mistakes accumulate or can accumulate through your life and some of them are, are mistakes in the processes that, that prevent you from, from, from developing cancer. They, de they prevent you from, they prevent cancer cells from running amok within your body. So in, in, during the course of one, one's life there's a tendency to erode these uh, protective mechanisms and it's when these protective mechanisms are eroded in certain times in certain individuals that they, they flourish into cancers. They expand uncontrollably and that's when we have to use these different therapies to tr try and rein them in and, and target them specifically. So to have cells that are, you know, mistakenly mm -hmm. sort of misfiring yeah. is a fairly common thing to happen. But we have other cells that are, it's their job to sort of squish them. Yes. And if they're not doing that job, it's sort of like guardians yes. kind of thing, then that's when cancer can All of that's true, emerge. but there's another twist to the story, okay. which is every time you get a cold or you uh, bash your leg against the coffee table, which I do every morning because I've got a coffee table that's got sharp edges, you it damage yourself and you have to repair that. Or if you have an infection, you have to get rid of the infection and repair the damage that the infectious entity has done to your lungs or your your kidney or, or whatever other bit of you gets over your, up, up your nose or various other sort of things. So the, the, the process of, of re regeneration and making more cells and making more tissue has to be something that's incredibly easy in the right place at the right time, but at the same time incredibly difficult to happen through this erosion of mu uh, through these mutations that you get that erode your capacity to rein in these precocious, really proliferating cells. So it's a conundrum. How do you make something really easy in the right place at the right time? And really difficult in the wrong place at the right, or, uh, the wrong time. And actually, we all do it every day. Do you have a bike, a bicycle? I have ridden a bicycle. You've ridden a bicycle, but uh, I am that... I am not a safe driver on a bicycle. Okay, well, let's I'm move a move wobbly move. cyclist. Okay, you're a wobbly <laughs> cyclist. Okay, but that's fine. It, it, the analogy still works. Yeah. Um, if you had a bicycle, you want to make sure that you can get on it when you need to get on it, but no one else can. How do you do that? Lock it. Yeah. So a lock is a combination. Okay. So what you do is um, the, the signal, the the instruction set that tells the cell that it's in a part of the body and it now has to replicate because that part of the body has been damaged or injured or infected or something else like that. Uh, the, those cells get this information, but it's not one bit of information that says go. It's bits of information that say go if you get the component A and you get the component B, but you don't get component C. So it's like a, a key going into a lock where you... You can't just open the pins, open the lock by opening the pins one at a time. You've got to take the first pin, move it up, the second pin, move it down, third pin, move it sideways, and so on and so forth. This is a combination lock. And our bodies work on the basis of combinatorial signals, controlling processes. So if you like a, a cell to divide, which it has to be able to divide very, very rapidly at the right place at the right time, it does so in deference to signals that come from multiple other cell types around it. And only that combination of other cell types and, and a combination of signals is enough to turn, the, turn the, 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 the switch and open up the lock and unlock the capacity of the cell. So we're, we're built to suppress precocious proliferation, but also nonetheless to allow it um, very easily in the right place at the right time. And a large part of it seems to be these combinations. So interesting what you were saying about the combination, because you can really get a sense of how individual it is. Yeah, yeah. And I think 
before I knew anything about cancer, mm -hmm. <laughs> before having cancer, I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I sort of imagined that breast cancer was one type of cancer and, you know, uh, blood cancers were sort of another type mm -hmm. that had you known. These really sort of blanket ideas about what it is. Um, and and the feeling that there should be like something fairly simple that should yeah. work and be robust and resilient so it should yeah. work all the time and not not be susceptible to being derailed and you think about it you've got 100,000 billion cells in your body that's that's more cells in your body than there are stars in a thousand milky ways <gasps> this is a huge huge number Oh, and in principle, any one of those could become a cancer cell, but almost almost none of them do. And in most people, they, n none of them does. I love numbers like that because it really, really it puts the unquantifiable, because again, we're not used to thinking of our bodies no, as that way. No. I read um, that book, was it Bill Bryson, about the body? And he said that if you lined up our cells... <laughs> They would go three times around the world. Yeah, probably more. If you, if each cell in your body has a, a DNA molecule that's over a meter long. Yes. So that's you know a yard, I guess it used to be for those <laughs> older, <laughs> older people in the audience like me. But uh, and that's packaged and wrapped up. Of course, it's very thin, packaged and wrapped up. But if you stretched out um, the the DNA, you'd go right 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 the way around the solar system. Yes. So it's a massive amount of of information. Any bits of it which could go wrong, but it's very carefully controlled and surveyed by these the deadlock mechanisms that prevent it from from going going off. Uh, inappropriately at the wrong place at the wrong time. When you're at a party mm -hmm. and somebody asks you, you know, about your job, what's what's the number one question that you get from people? Depends on the party. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, I'm a cancer biologist. It puts a lot of people off, <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, so I can come round to that. I usually say I'm a scientist. I'm interested in the biology of disease and then let them decide whether they want to go anywhere mm -hmm. nearer that. Um, and then also try not to lecture because, you know, the problem as a scientist is you, you, you spend a lot of your time sort of not lecturing each other but making your point mm -hmm. in a very specific and somewhat belaboured way some of the time because it's your point, not, not their point. So the discourse among scientists can often be not the sort of discourse you'd want in a party. I wouldn't say I'm the best person to have around in a party anyway. So <laughs> right, well, you can come to one of my parties <laughs> anytime. Right, that's very kind of you. We we'll, we'll just see how I fare. <laughs> we, um, we'd love that. <laughs> we'd love that kind of information. How you put things in a, that are incredibly complex in a way that is so um, understandable and relatable and kind of, yeah, I'm still, my mind is still blown about the Milky Way. I'll let you into a secret, though. The only way I can understand it is to use the same analogies. I think about cars and, you know... So, so for example, the, the way that cells get the information that it's time to proliferate because you've damaged yourself or, or, you're, you're, a, or you're a developing embryo or something else, so it is time and appropriate to proliferate. The signals are very short-lived. So it's exactly like a foot on the accelerator pedal of a car. If you take your foot off the accelerator of the pedal, you hope, I um, leave the side cruise control because that just makes a, makes a mess of the mm -hmm. a, a allegory. But you, you, what you expect to happen is, and you take your foot off the gas pedal, the gas pedal comes back up again and the car slows to a halt. So if you like, the default state of the cell is stop. And it's only when you're continuously inputting information, which means that everything is right and thumbs up around, the cells around are sending the right signals to you and you're interpreting them in the right combinations. Only when that's happening do you actually move forward to do this very dangerous thing, which is to proliferate as a cell. Because if you and your, and your progeny get stuck in that proliferative mode, that's cancer. So that's the most dangerous thing. Single cell propagating itself uncontrollably will, would would without intervention kill the patient so it's something it's a process that's got to be uh, able to be activated but where the default state is to shut it down yeah and yeah. i'll tell you there's something even weirder about this so some of these mutations are also configured such that if they if they get activated too much for too long, they not only um, they they actually call in uh, responses which kill the cell. And part of those responses are also cell suicide. The cells know when they're being when they're being pushed too hard for too long. We don't 
always know how, but nonetheless, they, they clearly are, they're not aware of it, but they, 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 there's some mechanism that means that they, they register this. And when they do that, they pull, pull the button and they commit suicide. By a, and every cell in our body has a suicide program re ready and raring to go. But again, that's got to be at the right place at the right time. Otherwise, it would be rather silly. Every time you divided, you would actually kill yourself and it doesn't get you very far. Yeah. I, I, you know, thinking about that, it just, it, how you put it, when you think of our cells, whether it be going around the world three times or mm. into outer space, and that most of the cells in our bodies are actually doing an incredible job. Yeah. You know, yeah. that they're, they're listening to the combinations All when the time. they need to, they're, they're pressing that button to mm -hmm. extinguish themselves because. Checking with each other. All yeah. okay. Yeah, you're okay. Thumbs up, thumbs up. So, so much communication yeah. happening. Thank God it's silent. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a roaring noise the whole time. Everything <laughs> checks in with everything. Hi, guy there. Hi there. Oh, yeah. I can, can just imagine a cacophony of cells. <laughs> yeah, chatter. Um, and, and really, it is such a small number, but that number increases with age, so with time. With the, error, the errors. The yeah, errors. They accumulate. So for, you know, we often hear it said that cancer is like often a disease of yeah. age. Yeah. Um, however, it does seem that in people in their 20s, 30s mm -hmm. and 40s, the numbers are now increasing. Is that something that you have have seen rising? Well, I certainly the clinicians have seen this, and it's a worldwide phenomenon, but let's be clear about what happens. So, so uh, the, the majority of cancers occur, way the biggest majority of cancers occur in older people. And they are evidenced by the fact that they've accumulated a lot of this damage and various other sort of things. And they, they probably have many, many different mutations in many different genes and many different processes. And, it, and even so, it's very, very, very unlikely. Which, don't forget, cancers arise from a single cell. So it's very unlikely. Most people don't even get a single cell that, that, go, that goes cancerous in the, in the course of their lives. But there's another group of cancers which affect young people, children obviously, and then people in their teens and up to their mid-twenties. They're not the same types of cancers as affect older people, generally speaking. There's some overlap. It tends to be a lot of leukemias and lymphomas and bone tumours and, 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 and so on and so forth. But what's been happening in the last 60 years is something that nobody really can quite understand why at the moment is there's an increase in proportion of young people, that is we're talking, I guess, I think officially above 14 and below 40, something like that, who are coming down with cancers which are similar in type to the ones that older people have been getting forever and um, driven by the same processes and mechanisms. Um, and we don't know why that is. I mean, but the process started in the post-Second World War period in the 50s and it's been incrementally increasing. It's still very, very low in absolute numbers. It's still very low. I mean, only 1% of cancers occur in people under the age of 45 or 50, I think. So I'm, I'm, you have to correct me if, if, if I got the figures not quite right, but it's something like that. So these things are still rare, but they are proportionally increasing. Um, and they've been increasing steadily decade by decade by decade. So the clue there is that something must have started happening in the 50s and 60s. And the guess is nutrition. The guess is probably not infectious agents. There have been infectious agents which are associated with cancers like HPV and, and AIDS and so on and so forth. But it's, it's not these, these sorts of cancers. There's something that's going on. And the, the most likely culprits are uh, obesity, diet, uh, air pollution. I mean, I'm not saying that these are the, the, the reasons. I'm just saying the most likely candidates are. But there could be something else as well. Um, there, there are many different. There are so many different factors, and this is also being seen worldwide. So, the, the, probably there's multifactorial. Uh, there's a multifactorial set of causes here, and uh, the, tr the problem is trying to sort out things which are culturally different, geographically different. They affect individual peoples with their individual genetic makeup in a different way. It's very, very hard to actually distill out what are cause and consequence and what are just associations. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, it's, it's very rare. Something's going on. 
it's still not a major risk factor for cancer in, pe in young people and middle-aged people, but it, it's something to watch and something that we're all very interested in, but we don't really have a clue. Well, we have clues, but that's all we have. So the last time that you were on the mm -hmm. podcast, we were talking about um, causes and cures. Yeah. And one of the things that came out of the discussion, which was really good, if you haven't listened to it, go back and, and take a listen. We were talking about the language and um, blame and kind of how culturally we fill in the gaps because cancer has for so long been such a mystery yeah. um, and, and so complex. Mm -hmm. And in there can be blame and blaming of ourselves, other people blaming us, yeah. um, you know, and just the the heaviness that can yes. come yeah. with that blame and how you're framing things in terms of how our bodies are usually doing so well, mm -hmm. amazingly well incredibly complex most of the right. time and how rare yeah it's it's amazing it's, it's so rare that it almost never happens it almost doesn't happen at all in a, a an animal like a human being because we are animals we're exceptionally well protected against cancer because you know we we live in to our 70s 80s 90s even hundreds now when most people don't get cancer I mean, you think about a mouse. A mouse is um, a thousand times smaller than a human being, but most of them get eaten. But those that don't get eaten will probably, about half of them will get cancer, but within a year or two. So the cancer rates don't, 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 um, don't um, mirror the sizes of, indivi of individual animals or their lifespan. And this is something called the Peto Paradox after Richard Peter, a very famous um, cancer epidemiologist, which is, he asked the question, you know, if a whale is a thousand times bigger than a human, why don't they get a thousand times more cancer? Because they've got a thousand times more cells. Yeah. And what this tells us, and there are all sorts of ideas about why that is, and better protection mechanisms, and these surveillance mechanisms are, are more uh, restricted and, and restricting in terms of how many signals you need for to get a cell to go into, into the pro proliferative phase and various other sort of things. But what it tells us is that, and human beings are way off scale, we live much, much longer than, than other apes um, of similar size. What it tells us is that um, the, the mechanisms that protect us against cancer are very varied and they change with speciation, with different species very rapidly. Otherwise, you, yeah, otherwise everything that was very small would have the same cancer risk as a human and mice would live forever because they, they've got a thousand times fewer cells and a thousand times less cancer. So there's thousand-year-old mice running around. And, <laughs> no, but there aren't. So it tells us that the um, our capacity to suppress cancer is something that emerged with our evolution and our lifestyle and our behaviour probably a couple of million years ago in hominids and so on and so forth. We don't really know why, and we're just lucky to have it. But it does mean that cancer protection isn't the best it could possibly be, and we can, uh, we can, we can pipe, pipe into that by doing the right things with our bodies. Of course, I don't want to sound like a preacher talking about don't get fat and don't smoke, and do, no, but don't do any of those things. Do do all the right things, eat, eat lots of fibre and various other sort of stuff. And you can tap into this amazing resistance that we actually have as our birthright, if you like, to cancer. So in there is kind of eating, looking after yourself, mm -hmm. the best, not perfect, yeah. not, no. you know, but the best way that you can yeah. is um, uh, an additional um, insulator. Yeah. But it's not... Not a guarantee. No, because you've got all no. those combinations, yeah. you've got all those billions of cells. Yeah. It's not a guarantee. And this is, I think, well, one, of, one of the questions I get asked the most is, uh, particularly by people who, uh, patients who have cancer, is why me? Mm. And the answer is, well, we can we can probably work out why you, but how much of that why is just accident, just bad luck? Some of it is, and and and. But the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is to, the, the thinking of the cancer, to stop thinking of the cancer as being a malevolent entity that's in a battle with you, because I think this frightens people. In fact, even w within the field of cancer biology, we use this shorthand of saying the tumour is progressing. Progression sounds like it's moving in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. It's got a goal and an aim, which yep. is to kill you. This is all rubbish. This is terrible biology. 
and the problem the problem is that tumor, cancers uh, develop and, and 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 change over the course of time by processes that are similar to evolution which is directionless there is many cancer cells that are going mad in one direction and, and dying prematurely in the other direction but we only see the winners Mm. And because we only see the winners, we sort of assume that only the winners are there. We don't see all the millions of bi and billions of cancer cells that never made the cancer, or or never made, or, or 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 never progressed with the rest of the cancer. So in fact, you know, we do a very very brilliant job. A lot of it's probability. We can up the odds in our favour a little bit for some people some of the time, but it's certainly worth a worth a punt. And the cancer's not out there to kill you. It's just basically software that's gone wrong. That does take away so much of the personal yeah. nature of it. That view, that scientific lens, mm. kind of stepping back and saying we're only seeing the winners mm -hmm. reminds me of a, a story about... Um, when they removed being gay or lesbian mm -hmm. as a psychiatric yes, condition yeah. in the DSM in America. Yeah. And there was a series of things that happened. It was not one. It was not one thing that happened. But one of the things was the night before they were due to vote, mm -hmm. uh, so all the psychologists, yeah, psychiatrists yeah. and everything were all together, uh, someone said, oh, let's go out for a drink and accidentally brought them into a gay bar. <laughs> Air quotes on accidentally. Basically, you had all these, you know, mm, yeah. um, psychologists and whatever, and they were seeing all these happy, happy people. gay people. Happy normal people. Yes, but they had never seen them before because no, they had only ever seen people yes. when they were, um, you know, in, in mental distress. Mm -hmm. And so they had thought that to be gay was to be yes. in distress, and they thought they were helping. And the next day, you know, so I can yeah. imagine them going up to people going... Are you happy? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. And uh, you know the gay people that were out that night going, yeah, yeah I'm having a great time. Yeah. Um, so that thing of you know, there's so many different lenses, yes. and how we view things, how we frame things, can just so change our relationship to them. That's right. And that just reminded me of yeah. uh, you know seeing, you know, and when. When you're in a position that you are a young person with cancer, you've fallen into this really rare mm -hmm. demographic. Yeah. And it feels a bit like there's a spotlight. Yeah. And actually, if it's useful to think about kind of the reframing and, and actually our bodies are always trying to do their best um, yeah. if if we were to give them what's the word for that thing when we give something human attributes oh uh, well uh, uh, anthropomorphism yes that's yeah. the one um, if we you know like our bodies are yeah. always working for us but yeah no, I mean, it re is really important because, you know, this, this idea that cancer cells are cunning, they're smart, they're, mm. they're, they're not. I mean, most cancer cells die because they, they're completely screwed up. But as I say, we, we don't see the ones that die because they get <coughs> cleared away by the various clearance mechanisms in the body, and, which are very efficient. So we only see the bad ones that continually propagate and survive, and they cause the disease. And so it's very easy to think of them, of them as being very cunning and, and planning a strategy. Mm. Nothing like this is happening whatsoever. It's completely directionless. It's blind. Now, that doesn't help you deal with the disease, but it does help you deal with the, with the illness. Yeah. And that's important because otherwise there's a tendency to blame people for their own disease. And as you rightly said, it depends, then it depends on how you define a disease. Being gay is not a disease. It's mm -hmm. just an aspect of human, human, human colour and, and diversity, which we, uh, uh, which we love now. So I think, you know, taking away the sting of cancer, taking away the, the emotional component of it as best you can, and realising these are people who've got a bit of a bug in their software. And our job, my job as a cancer biologist, is to fix the bug. That's all I know. And that's what I'll do. Thank you. I'm so glad you're on the case. <laughs> I'm really, really... And so are a lot of many, many other colleagues as well, of course. Well, I appreciate all of them. So, thinking about what's coming down the pipe, mm -hmm. what can we expect to be looking out for in the future? Well, as I say, um, the revolution in... in well, m most therapies um, 
uh, the novel therapies um, in cancer treatment in the last 10, 15 years have tended to be directed at the cancers that arise in older people. I suppose there's an, uh, breast cancer is a bit of an exception, and melanoma is a bit of an exception because they can they they can hit younger people. But nonetheless, you get the general gist. And that's because because we've we've been able to identify a lot of the problems, so the software glitches within these cancers. Now, um, if you're thinking about cancers in younger people, well, these this new increase in cancers, which is as I say, starts from a very very low level, but is nonetheless increasing. Uh, th these cancers seem to be driven by the same processes as, a, as drive some of these uh, old uh, age-associated cancers, for which we now have many, many different therapeutic options. So these um, therapeutic options could therefore be applied equally well, uh, presumably, to younger people who have these cancers driven by the same mutations. Th there's some technical problems there. A lot of these um, drugs are specified for people with a certain age distribution of cancers and they're not specified or, 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 or um, facilitated for people who are younger but that's just a question of you know authorization and getting it through the FDA and NICE and various other sort of things so and the development of these targeted drugs is going at such a pace now that when one drug fails and some of these drugs do fail many of them do fail after a while because the the target that they're de de designed to inhibit or block or remove or anything else uh, stops being important in that cancer because all the cancer cells that, in which it was important, they've died away and you're left with the winners which use some other mechanism. But now we can leapfrog onto the, the, the new mechanism and uh, treat patients who, who, who are succumbing again to re relapsing, treat them with more drugs. And the drug development goes faster than the cancer can go because there's just so many different options. That's in the ideal world. So that's really great. Then we've got this remarkable uh, uh, set of observations that our immune systems can distinguish between normal cells and cancer cells. They just don't do it for a variety of reasons, which we are now beginning to understand, and we can now potentiate um, our immune systems to go in and uh, remove cell by cancer cell by cancer cell the disease from patients. And that's only going to get better. But then there's some other things which we can do more easily. So we're about, I think we're about to enter a new era of cancer diagnosis. And by this I mean um, very early detection because there are already being, there's already talk of blood tests for, for general cancers being used. These are non-interventionist mechanisms where you don't need a big a big screener or a lot of money or you don't need people to come in and have biopsies taken you just take a little bit of blood so the 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 uh, our ability to monitor and detect cancers at a very early stage is going to improve i think stupendously over the next decade or two so i suspect you know we'll be moving into a world where um most people get a, get a, get screened regularly now with young people's cancers one of the problems has been hitherto that their, their cancer is unexpected. Yeah. So GPs are not ready to spot that and they yeah. think it must be something else because the rule of being a GP, I think, which is quite sensible, is it's usually the most common thing um, of all the different options. You try, try to sort that out first. So I think, you know, that has to be put into me medical practice, which is, you know, we need to suspect cancer more often in young people and just don't assume it's not cancer because they're young. But I think all of these things are real, really great hope. Everyone's on board with this, and the future is very exciting. And uh, let's let's hope it continues to be delivered fairly at the point of need yes. for all people, because everyone's lovable. Yes, absolutely. Can I ask, out of those, which are the ones that, where they? Because we hear a lot about personalised mm -hmm. medicine. It, is that where they're looking at your actual DNA to see which drugs yeah. are going to be the next line? Yeah. yeah. And even there, there are two approaches. So one approach is that in order to treat cancers properly, you're going to need to um, have a complete map of all the bits and bugs that have gone wrong, all the mutations that have gone wrong in those patients with that disease at that time. But there is a different view. And the different view is one that I subscribe to. And it's not doesn't mean to say it's right. It just means it's an alternative mm -hmm. uh, view, view, which is there is a lot of commonality across cancers. So in the end, the if you like, it's a little bit like um, 
let's think of an analogy. Um, you're tuning into um, Netflix or Amazon.com or various other things. You've got one box that gives you the picture in your living room, but it can tap into many, many different upstream signals. And the, the things that go wrong are the upstream signals, but if you, if you, if you took out the TV then you'd stop those horrible commercials and various other sort of things. Of course, you'd stop watching the TV as well. But, but nonetheless, can you, can you take out the common elements in these signaling programs and the instructional programs that drive cancer? Can you take out the, the common components and develop therapies around that? Because they won't be easy to evade by, by evolution and, mm -hmm. and, and the natural selection in, in, in the cancer and so on and so forth. And we just don't know because we don't have very many drugs against these um, nodes, if you like, these con conserved common nodes. But that's already starting. There's a, a, a gene called RAS, three genes called RAS, which are mutated. They're like basically light switches. A lot of these things are light switches. So they, in response to a signal from outside the, telling the cell to grow, the RAS molecule undergoes a, a change in shape, which then propagates that signal to the various sub sites within the cell to organize the growth and proliferation of that cell. So these are nodes, and RAS was for, for a long, long time said to be undruggable. It doesn't have the features of a molecule that we know how to drug with our existing pharmacology. All that's changing now. So there are RAS inhibitors. They came. They were invented about three to five years ago. They're improving all of the time, and they just are paving the way for how we will be able to target all the things that we couldn't target. We would have liked to target for can to treat cancer patients. We will be able to, and I think in ten, fifteen years. Well, there won't be much that we can't turn off at will within cancer patients in order to get a therapeutic benefit. I love this for many reasons. Um, I remember one of the things that you said in the previous podcast as well is that when we get to the point where someone's diagnosed and they're given a treatment, there won't be any attribution of blame or no. it being really personal. It's, it will be, here's your pill to make it better. Yeah. And yeah, dad will come home and say, yeah, I got cancer. And everyone will go, oh, thank God we can cure it. Yeah. It'll happen. And that's that's absolutely the the vision yeah. that that we want. So, um, but this is not the only time that uh, Shine gets to mm. <laughs> spend time with you. Um, you're also a keynote speaker for our Shine conference. Yeah, it's very kind to be invited. I don't know what I did, but <laughs> I'm very very happy to help Shine out. Of course, well, yeah. whatever you need. Oh uh, well, you know we're always delighted to have you. And Shine runs the only conference and the largest mm. for um, young adults yeah. um, in the country yeah. and um, it's going on from October 14th to October 19th. It's going to be partially in person so you can come and see Professor Gerard Evan in person um, on the 14th, Saturday the 14th. That's going to be in London but it is a hybrid event so there will be some in-person um, sessions and also a lot of online sessions and there's so many different topics that are going on. Um, everything from processing your cancer baggage mm -hmm. uh, to music therapy and I'll be running a chill out session <laughs> so basically how to calm your body in the middle of you know what can be a lot going on mentally yeah. physically and emotionally so if that sounds good to you head on over to shinecancersport.org register for your spot um, we're really looking forward to seeing you there and I um, want to say a really massive thank you um, to you for being with us today and sharing this knowledge and sharing some, um, yeah, kind of inspiration for... Oh, that's very kind of you. And for thank you for the privilege come. of being able to talk to people who, you know, who need comfort and support and understanding. So it's a real privilege. Thank you. Well, it's lovely to know that you're working on the other side <laughs> of things. Thank you so much. And thank you, as always, to the incredible radio facilities for recording us today and sponsoring our podcast. Till next time. Bye. Not your grandma's cancer show.